chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. And uh, let's take this opportunity to read from God's holy and errant and inspired word. Then delivered he him therefore to them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew language Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus was in the middle. And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. Then said the chief priest to the Jews to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. This is the word of God. Well, we now come to some of the final events in the hour of the cross that Jesus has alluded to his whole life. All throughout his earthly ministry, he said, my hour has not yet come. Uh, at the first miracle, he said to his own mother, uh, Mary, my time has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But now we find ourselves in John 20 and Christ's hour has come. He turned it another way and said it's the hour of the power of darkness. Seemingly, uh, Satan looks to have the victory over Christ in his crucifixion and death. But we understand that the way John writes is he's writing to the fact that God is sovereign or rules over all things. God is never out of control. Jesus lays down his life. He offers it up. It's not taken from him. Amen? And we must be clear here of John's intent and the spirit of God's intent as John is writing these things. And let's also remember as we lean into this text this morning and pull it apart piece by piece to encourage us and inspire us uh, that Jesus has shown us a love beyond knowledge out of Ephesians 3, that the crucifixion itself is uh, certainly when we think of the cross, the hour, uh, we look at that. But the cross event <coughs> is everything from Christ's suffering in the garden uh, right through to his mock trial and crucifixion right through to the finishing works of the cross, uh, which are his um, burial and, and ascension uh, and resurrection. And of course, the continuing work of the cross, which is preached uh, and made real in people's lives to this very wow. present hour. So we've seen the sufferings of Christ and we'll continue to see that today of his humanity, but we will also see the sovereignty of God in Christ's deity in the Gospel of John. Uh, and how God works through the most wicked event in all human history to turn it to our salvation. Yeah. Now, only God can do that, friends. Only God can turn unscrambled, scrambled eggs, if you like. Only God can take what man's made a wicked mess of uh, and turn it to our good and his glory. Yeah. Uh, and this is why we believe in a God who is divine, supernatural. And, and friends, this is why we can, quite frankly, look at disasters and sinful, wicked acts in the world and know that God is greater than those things. Although they are allowed to occur, God can turn those things for His good in our glory. And how would we even know goodness without wickedness? How would we even know grace without forgiveness? How would we even know the wonder of light and forgiveness and love without those other things in this world. And God has structured the world to be so. We will see, uh, if you're taking notes, firstly, um, Christ's sovereignty in this gospel, uh, particularly over the next couple of weeks in these things. Firstly, that scripture is being fulfilled. All these things are happening to fulfill scripture that was written hundreds of years ago. So all of these things are taking place. Uh, God uh, has written these things uh, in past history through the prophets and they are being fulfilled. The dominoes are falling 
of Scripture being fulfilled, particularly on the cross. Think of Psalm 22, uh, a vivid description that can point to no other event uh, or point in time other than the cross and, uh, and Roma in power and their crucifying Christ. So on multiple counts, Scripture is being fulfilled. Uh, and it's a proof that God controls all events in history. If Scripture wasn't fulfilled, then God doesn't control all events in history. The Bible is the only book that still cannot be confounded for unfulfilled uh, prophetic events. Sure, there's Nostradamus, there's lots of people in the world that prophesy things, but they don't have a 100% hit record, do they? And uh, the Bible does. Incidentally, everyone, the crucifixion of Christ this morning is a historically attested fact. It's written not just by the scriptural writers, but it's written by Josephus, Eusebius, Roman and Jewish historians in the world over historical fact. Christ lived, Christ died, Christ crucified, and Christ was risen from the dead. We cannot, through all sane logical reasoning, refute known factual recorded history. To do so would be, quite frankly, ludicrous. Secondly, we'll see that the sacrificial giving of Christ was for his people. Christ did not die in vain. He was not another martyr. Uh, he gave his life for a particular purpose, and that purpose is seen fulfilled even in and upon the cross when salvation to others is taking effect. Uh, and, and that Christ lays down his life. His life was not taken from him. Thirdly, we'll see uh, what, we, what we will deem as the supernatural. I'm alliterating these all with a capital uh, letter S here. Uh, the supernatural sympathy for Christ, uh, whereupon we will see uh, people looking to Christ beyond a normal man. Uh, there is a divine effect to what Christ has done here. Uh, and finally, we'll see the statements regarding our Lord's person from people who are not Christians. So you're getting statements from people who are not believers. They do not acknowledge Christ, but they're acknowledging Him. This is the sovereignty of God at work. God controls even the unregenerate heart to give it a confession of faith. Let me give you some examples. Uh, Pilate himself said six times, I find no fault in this man. Here's a guy that was obviously going to make things a lot more expedient to have Jesus put out of the way, uh, but he's done that. The thief on the cross will say, uh, this man has done nothing uh, to cause this type of death. He's done nothing wrong. The sign placed over Jesus' head is Pilate's way of saying, this man is not guilty, he's a king. Uh, Judas himself, the betrayer of the twelve, said, I have betrayed innocent blood. He's not a Christian. And Pilate's wife says to Pilate himself before the mock trial, uh, have nothing to do with this man. Um, he is a just man. That's got to be the sovereignty of God right there. Today we'll look at three uh, key critical outlines. And let me encourage you again, if you've got questions, of which I'm sure there'll be a few, uh, you're welcome to write them down and uh, we'll cover them on Wednesday night. We'll look at verses 16 through 18. Christ crucified at Calvary. Verse 19, Christ dividing all men at Calvary. John's very clear about setting a picture before our eyes how Christ was crucified between two other men. And then thirdly, we'll see Christ proclaimed as King at Calvary. Until then, I've got my work cut out for me. Uh, please stay with me. You've got your Bibles open to John chapter 19. Let's pull it apart verse by verse. And let me explain as we uh, focus our hearts and minds on this passage this morning. Uh, my prayer is that God will give you light to see Christ in all of his glory upon the cross of Calvary uh, today. Verse 16. Then he delivered him, that is Pilate, the prosecuting, uh, the ruling judge at that point in time of Rome, unjustly delivered Christ to them to be crucified. Who's the then? Well, James Montgomery Boyce tells us, particularly, it was a centurion and four Roman soldiers. Uh, every crucifixion that took place in the Roman world had uh, an accompanying guard with them. Uh, the reason being is the typical response to somebody being handed over to be crucified, one could simply imagine by sitting in this place this morning. 
Uh, many of us have watched uh, TV shows where, or, or some sort of footage on a documentary where the accused has been finally read the sentence. And in a court of law, as the sentence is read to them, uh, that they are going to be incarcerated for life or they will receive the death penalty, what's the normal response that we can sometimes see from the accused as the, uh, the uh, sentence is read before their very eyes, their ears hear it and the ramifications hit home in their very hearts is what? It can be fear, it can just be a hanging of the head, but in many cases, it's a lashing out. It's a running at the judge. It's a swinging your hands and uh, people become like a wild animal, if you like. And uh, I've got written here that uh, historically, uh, knowing what crucifixion is and was, uh, knowing the excruciating agony that would soon be uh, entailed upon the person, uh, the reaction would be to fight and to resist and to do all in their power to escape. But not so in Jesus' case. I want us to see this here. Uh, one author says that men in this predicament would be driven like a wild animal and controlled until their intended end upon the cross. But this verse ironically shows us a fulfilment of Scripture in Isaiah 53, 7, the classic chapter on Christ's crucifixion, where it says that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as you can see in part B of verse 16, then they took Jesus and they, note everyone, led him away. <coughs> Christ is being led as a sheep to the slaughter. He's going to the cross of Calvary, the place or the hill of the skull to lay down his life. He's going with purpose. He is accompanied by the centurion and four guards, but ultimately he is being taken to the place of God's foreordained plan. And verse 17 tells us, and Christ, that is he, bearing his cross, I want you to note everyone that Christ had to bear the cross. No other man could have done that. No, you couldn't have done that. It's uh, a fallacy. It's pointless to say that you should have died on that cross because you could have died on a cross, but you couldn't have redeemed all of sin's humanity. You couldn't have even redeemed your own humanity. So the whole notion in your own head of, well, Christ died for me in my place. Well, yes, he did, but you couldn't have died on your behalf. Only a sinless, perfect son of God could have died on our behalf. And remember, only God himself can take and expiate away sins. And so Jesus, bearing his plot, that cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull. The place of death, by the way, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Of course, as an example for us as all true believers, what are we called to do? We're called to take up our cross as well. Uh, in a sense, we carry our lesser cross but Christ carried the greater burden, didn't he? He carried the, the uh, primary cross. He carried the greater cross of Calvary uh, and led the way for us who are all true believers. And friends, let us be thankful this morning that Christ did bear the cross on our behalf. That he did carry that weighty cross of Calvary uh, upon his own shoulders. Uh, and we are to obviously walk in his stead. Uh, of all the wood that Jesus carried as a carpenter, of all the wood that he carried for his earthly father, Joseph, uh, and pictured in there is this picture of uh, Old Testament Isaac carrying uh, the wood for his father, Abraham, up the hill of Moriah, asking his dad, what will the sacrifice be? Uh, where's the sacrifice, daddy? not knowing that he would be the sacrifice, Abraham's only son. Yet in this picture we see Christ bearing the wood, not of his earthly father, but for the last time in human history, the touch of wood and timber upon his worn and scourged and beaten flesh, carrying the weight of that wooden cross, not for his earthly father this time, Joseph, but for his heavenly father, not to satisfy a pain client, but to satiate the sins of his people that he would pay for on that day. Uh, God himself providing the one final full Passover lamb for the expiation of all sins for those who would believe on Christ Jesus. 
Uh, this is just an amazing <coughs> picture of what Christ would do. The fact that it's astounding, historians tell us, that Christ at this point could even carry anything. He's been beaten, he's been scourged. Outwardly, I want you to see that, 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 that he is uh, literally disfigured beyond recognisement. Uh, the fact that he could even carry after the beatings and the scourgings the weight of the cross, let alone that that's the external punishments, but what about the internal? Uh, Isaiah 53, I was reading it again yesterday, it says that he was afflicted and oppressed for the believers he died for. Afflicted outwardly and oppressed inwardly. Think of what Christ carried inwardly. He carried the weight of every sin. Do you know what sin leads to? It leads to death. That's why Jesus had to taste death for all of us. The results of sin are death. And Jesus had death working in his physical body. Death brings fear, anxiety, and all of those things he's carrying on our behalf. He's taken the fear and the sting out of death, friends, this morning. But he's having to wear that uh, in, in this cross event. He uh, perseveres and carries the cross to again fulfill scripture. What scripture, you ask? He must be lifted up to draw all men to himself. Lifting up. It's Christ prophesying of his own crucifixion. What a powerful prophecy that is. Christ knew how he would die. He knew he had to carry and bear the weight of a physical cross to the point where he had to get to Calvary to be lifted up on the cross that from there he could ultimately say, it is finished. I've been lifted up. I can now draw all men to myself. Let's turn to Hebrews for a moment, the book of Hebrews, chapter 13. And this verse also tells us that he was taken out. It is filled with prophecy. It is filled with Old Testament types and shadows of Christ in every moment of Scripture here. Scripture is being fulfilled. Old Testament Scripture is being fulfilled. Hebrews 13, verses 11 and 12. For the bodies of those animals... That is, all of the sacrificial lambs that pointed to Christ in the Old Testament, whose blood was brought into the holy place as an atonement to cover for sin, if you like, by the high priest as an offering for sin, were burned where? Where were they burned? Where were their bodies burned? They were burned outside of the camp, outside of the Old Testament Israelite camp. In this case, where the temple was in Jerusalem was now the, the, the camp, if you like, and, and Jesus was therefore, verse 12, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside of the gate. That is, outside of the gates of Jerusalem, where he was to be crucified. Just like the scapegoat was taken outside of the city, Christ's body was to be taken out, and it was to be put on display. He was to be sacrificed, if you like, on behalf of uh, of the sins of his people and lay down his life outside of the city. And this place, John says, was the place of the skull in Hebrew Golgotha. Uh, you know, we are often say and sing, don't we, on that hill of Calvary, on Calvary's tree. Well, in Hebrew, it's Golgotha. In Latin, it's Calvaria. So when we say the hill of Calvary, the cross of Calvary, it's the cross of the skull. When we say Calvary, that's what we're saying. And of course, the precise location is not known, uh, but we know that uh, the way crucifixion worked is that people were made an example of by Rome so that they didn't break the Roman laws. And so Rome wanted to scare people. You break our laws, this is what happened to you. So they didn't put Jesus out in the black back blocks. He was on a, a main street outside of the city where everyone could see. And John clearly tells us in the text that many Jews saw who it was. Jesus could be clearly seen and identified as him who was being crucified and laying down his life. He was near to the city. Uh, he was on a main road passing by. Uh, of course, now, uh, geographically, archaeologically, there are many uh, metres that, that you'd have to dig down to get to that place, and nobody really knows the location, although when you visit there, they'll tell you where it is, um, the place of the skull. Uh, is uh, still not known. What we do know is it's outside of the walls of Jerusalem, it's in public view, and it's very close or near to the city. 
Verse 18. Where they crucified him, that's the centurion and the four soldiers. Where they crucified him and two others with him on either side and Jesus in the center. Crucifixion here is obviously something that uh, in our own modern world would be deemed completely inhumane. And to the Jews it was as well. But it was commonly practiced in the ancient world by the Egyptians, the Carthaginians, Persians, Germans, Assyrians, Greeks, and the Romans actually borrowed it uh, off of the Carthaginians. Uh, uh, sorry, the Persians who originally invented it, some believe, for their own ritualistic and religious reasons, uh, lifting up a criminal off the earth because they cursed the earth while walking upon it. The Romans employed this form of punishment is one of their vivid examples of what it was to go against the power of Rome. You want to play with Rome? Have a look at what happens to you. At uh, a couple of very vivid points in history, we see the Roman general Varcus crucified 2,000 Jews at the front of Jerusalem, letting people know what he thought of their religion in one day. Uh, at the height of crucifixion, uh, many of you will know this name at the close uh, of the war with Spartacus, the gladiator. He himself, uh, the gladiator, saw and witnessed 10,000 slaves from Capua to Rome lying the streets, 10,000 of them crucified as an example that Rome were the ruling power and you weren't to defy their uh, rule force, if you like. Crucifixion as a form of punishment to the Jew, though, uh, was... Uh, acknowledged in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy 21, 22. And it was where criminals were hung on a tree. It was a posthumous indignity according to the Jews and struck horror into the heart of every pious Israelite who beheld it. Cicero, many of you would have heard of, historically named crucifixion the cruelest and the foulest of all punishments. Tacitus said it's a despicable death. Uh, J.C. Ryle records um, what I think is a very unbloodied version of what a crucifixion might look like in highlight. The common mode of inflicting, he says, in all probability was to strip the criminal bare, lay them on a cross on their back, nail their hands to two extremities of the cross piece or a fork of the cross, Nail their feet to the upright piece or the stem of the cross, raise the cross on end, drop it into a hole prepared for it, and then leave the sufferer to linger. Painful death. Uh, it's not been great to read the historical accounts of crucifixion where we see John and Mary at the foot of the cross. You know what? You want to know why relatives wanted to be there? Because, and the Roman guard had to be there. They had to stay there to make sure that the family didn't take the criminal off the cross because they could recover, and then Rome's form of punishment would have been undone. So the guards had to stay there until they were dead, which is why the guards make quick work by breaking legs and we want to move on with the rest of our job roles and tasks. And the spear goes through Jesus' side to fulfil the prophecy that not a leg or a bone of him would be broken. But the crucified were left on a cross. They could not be touched and uh, birds and, and wild beasts would come and, and eat them and try and get to them. Uh, and of course the family would try and stay there uh, to uh, protect uh, their loved one, although they had passed away from this. Uh, this whole mode of crucifixion was so that uh, John uh, writes earlier in John 3 uh, that Jesus would fulfil the fact that he said that he would be uh, like the snake lifted up in the wilderness, uh, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Great picture of the book of Genesis where uh, Jesus um, uh, takes uh, the curse, if you like, um, uh, from off of his people. And we know that the snake is a cursed thing in the garden. Uh, Psalm 22, we'll look at probably more on Wednesday, the vivid picture, prophetic picture that could not possibly be written without divine guidance as to what crucifixion looked like uh, because in many ways uh, they, they did not know that uh, Christ was going to be crucified at the point of writing Psalm 22. From a vivid point of view, uh, the physical stages of crucifixion as written by Richter in John's Bible, Archaeology, 
are sixfold. Firstly, the unnatural position and violent tension of the body uh, that is having to bear the weight of itself upon only three points of weight bearing caused painful sensation from the least motion. The nails, secondly, were driven through parts of the hand and feet which were full of nerves, and the tendons uh, would create the most extinguished, exquisite anguish. Three, the exposure of so many wounds and lacerations brings on inflammation which tend to become gangrenous and every movement brings even more poignancy of suffering. Four, the distended parts of the body, blood flows from those arteries and then carried back into the veins, uh, blood finds its way to the aorta and into the head and the stomach of the blood vessels, the head becomes pressed and swollen, the general obstruction of circulation ensures to an excitement and exertion of anxiety which... Uh, in the author's statement here, is more intolerable than death itself. Fifthly, the inexpressible misery and gradual increasing of lingering anguish. Uh, some accounts of crucifixions, the uh, victim was left on the cross alive for up to three or four days. And finally, burning and raging thirst. Of course, we see one of the words that Jesus says is, I thirst uh, upon the cross. Historically, it's important as we look at this topic, although we aren't meant to conjure up images in our mind of Jesus lest we come up with some false god, as we talked about idolatry on Wednesday night, uh, John has painted a vivid picture for us of a cross, of Christ uh, being um, crucified in the midst of two other people. So John's deliberately painting a picture for us. Let us firstly look at the cross. The cross we see in history... The cross we wear around our necks is most likely not the cross of Calvary. Firstly, it's too big to carry. Uh, it's too bulky with the big cross beams uh, to be carried by a single individual. Too large, too high. The real crosses of antiquity, as we study, um, were a little longer than the victim, whose head was near to the top and whose feet often hung only 12 to 13 inches from the ground. So what we see in Christ's crucifixion is probably a T-piece with a, a, a name tag at the top. And halfway down uh, the, the pole, uh, you'll literally see another piece that the, the, the crucified person would lean upon to try and take the weight. So they would often be in this crouched position as they had their hands like this, uh, only a few feet from the ground on a T-piece from the cross. This was again uh, to, and that was from Chandler, uh, the, the historian that wrote that. This was again to fulfil scripture. But two others, John tells us, were crucified with him, Jesus, in the same. Now I don't want you to miss this, because I think this is very important in John's writing of, of the gospel. Uh, Isaiah 53.12 says that... Uh, I will allot him a portion with the great, speaking of Christ. He will divide the booty with the strong because he's poured out himself to death. And watch this. He was numbered, three of them, he was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and he interceded for those transgressors. Well, here is a great picture of Christ being crucified among sinners. <coughs> Jesus was not only one with sinners, he not only identified with our sin, he became sin on our behalf. And so here we hear this classically portrayed picture or this view of Jesus at the centre with two other transgressors or criminals being crucified <coughs> either side of him. And this is noted in scripture for a reason. It's the great visual picture of the gospel. We know that at the cross... Christ is the great divider of all men. He separates all men. We're separated whether we believe in Him or whether we don't believe on Him. He is the great divider of all men. And the question must be asked of us this morning, on what side of Christ do you stand? Here is a, an attested, proven, historical fact uh, that men have landed either side of Christ and we see this vividly painted by John and the other gospel writers. Are we either for him or against him? 
You cannot bridge that little gap. You cannot play safe here. I want to do my own thing, but I don't want to be necessarily for Christ. I want to be religious, but I don't want to believe the gospel. I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to have anything to do with the church. I want to claim Christ has taken my sin, but still live in sin. Christ is the clear delineator of those who believe and those who don't believe. He bears the weight of sin for those who do believe, not for those who don't believe. And a thief on one side represents all the redeemed of the Lord, whom Christ died to save. And on the other side, all those who mock Christ and will bear the weight of their own sins in an eternal second death. Does not Christ divide time from AD to BC? Does he not divide all men from believer to unbeliever? If you believe on Christ, you'll be saved. If you don't believe on him, you'll be condemned. Christ said it himself. We do not honour his words. We dishonour him and therefore dishonour the Father who sent his Son. Those on one side will see Christ in paradise moments after they take their last breath in this life. On the other side, they will enter into an eternal fire where their fears and torment will never cease for eternity and beyond. What a vivid and all-filled picture John actually paints for us of the Lord who is the separator of all men. Did not Jesus say himself, I've come to bring a sword. I will separate mother from father. I will separate son from daughter. Friends, in our own families, we've felt in many ways the pain of that sword in that Christ has separated us for whatever reason, even out of the same womb. We know that some were separated. God loved some and hated others. Christ is the great separator of all men. Yet he lays down his life as a proof of his love for all men. God's grace is shown to all men. But not all men will believe, not all men will come to him because they love their sin more than they love Christ. Verse 19, now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was this, Jesus of Nazareth, I want you to see this, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. What's John been trying to do? John 20, 31. John's been trying to prove all the way along that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the one who would come in the flesh, The son of the living God. He's God as well. He's in flesh. He's man. But he's God. You know what this title encapsulates that Pilate wrote? Not John wrote. John didn't go up to Pilate and say, might be good for you to help with the scripture that you write this in on that. No. What we see here is a divine fulfillment and proclamation of Jesus being proclaimed. uh, The great God in whom whom he was. Jesus, that is his saving name. You will call his name Jesus and he will what? Save his people from their sins. Jesus is his saving name. Pilate proclaims Christ's saving name upon the cross. Don't tell me that's not sovereignty. And then, of course, he's king of the Jews. Pilate never denied the fact that Jesus was king of of a kingdom, but not in Rome, not in Jerusalem. He was king of a heavenly kingdom. He was king of everyone's heart who would believe on him. He was ruler of all. F.F. Bruce helps us here with this statement that Pilate wrote this. It makes it sound like he wrote it with his own hands. This does not mean that he personally formed the letters with his own hand, but rather most likely chose and dictated the wording with the deliberate purpose of annoying the Jewish priests. He is the king of the Jews. We know that because later on the Jews come back and say, don't write, he's king of the Jews. Change it. Change it to he said he's the king of the Jews. We know that that got to them, and we know that's why Pilate most likely write it personally for his own reasons, but God controlled his hand to make a declaration that the man upon the cross was not just the man that he's already proclaimed, behold the man, but behold the great God man who is before you laying down his life. Yes, God sovereignly used uh, this great statement to speak of the truth of Christ. It was customary in the day that as you were crucified, uh, that as you're walking through the street or or through the the, the main pathway that you were made an example of. And this placard, this name, this is Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews, would either be worn around the criminal's neck and hung as this uh, sort of name tag that shamed you, or, or it was brought, if you were too weak or nearly at point of death, carried by maybe one of the soldiers who would show everyone 
This is what this person's getting crucified for. This is what this person is guilty of. And it was to put fear again in the hearts of those who would look on. Now, I want you to note here that what is written on this uh, placard, uh, what is written uh, is Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Friends, there is no crime written on this placard. And you know why? Because Jesus is innocent. This is Pilate's seventh time now to say, I find no fault in him at all, yet I proclaim him the great God-man. Is God not in control? You don't think Pilate wants to proclaim Jesus as Lord, but that's exactly what he's doing. I do not find any condemnation in him, although Pilate has been blackmailed by the Jews. If you don't crucify this man, you are no friend of Caesar. So he's blackmailed. And of course, Pilate thinks he's doing it. Jesus already told him, you have no power to do anything unless it's given to you from above. I give up my life. God allows you to do this. And God's sovereign over all events, even the most wicked and cruel event in all human history. I love this. Uh, God ensures in his sovereign providence that um, Pilate not only gets it accurate, he gets it thorough. Not only is he accurate, Jesus is king of the Jews. He is the saving person of Christ, but he gets it thorough. He writes it in all the known languages of the world, in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. We're going to see this because this is just God's handiwork at place. Uh, George Herbert says that God held his hand or their hands while they wrote. And this title was a little gospel in that the great three languages on earth were proclaimed. Here you have a picture of what it would have looked like in all three languages hanging upon the cross. No uh, statement of criminality. No statement of guilt. Simply a proclamation of his saving name upon the cross. Luke tells us in 2338 that it was written in Greek, Latin and Hebrew. Uh, What do these three languages represent to us? Well, Hebrew represents uh, the power of religion. Greek, the power of culture. Latin, uh, the power of government and force and rule. Uh, All of these, Christ's name was written that he would reinvent all of these things. He would uh, reinvent what religion looked like, culture of the kingdom and power. We know that the gospel of Christ was to be clearly proclaimed and published in all the known languages of the world. And this is a a great uh, appetizer, a preemptor, a starter, if you like, for the great proclamation of the gospel in all the languages of the known world. Friends, what do we see in the book of Acts? As the Spirit of God is poured out upon the disciples, and the disciples begin sort of mammering and stammering in all these different tongues, but what are the people in the crowd hearing? God takes the foolishness of men in tongues, and he makes it. To be heard, what a miracle, by the people in the crowd as the praises of God to him who saved them. As the wonderful works of the great God who was able to proclaim in all the different languages of the Carthians, of the Thinian, all of those people, okay, Uh, that, that heard all of these things. Do you not think that's God's supernatural way of making sure... Every language, every tribe, every tongue would know and hear the gospel of Christ and what he did for them upon that cross of Calvary. Don't be telling me God is this uh, cosmic child abuser of his own son. God is the most gracious, merciful God because without that sacrifice, you've got no way of dealing with your sins and you go to hell. But, friends, God is merciful. He is merciful to us in the sending of his only son. God himself rectify the situation and being able to save us. I love what George Herbert says here. He says, If like the Greeks, I prize beauty and wisdom above everything beside, it says here in this sign to the Greeks, Here is your king. He alone can create beauty within your soul and can banish its ugliness and make it lovely. He alone can teach you the truest wisdom, the wisdom which answers all of your questions and gives you peace. To the Latins, George Herbert says, who prize law and government and empire. It says to you, Jesus is your king. He will bring you under the best law, the most beneficial law, the most gracious law. He will teach you how to even govern yourself and will win for you the empire 
over your own heart, both here and now. To the Hebrew who prizes righteousness through religion, far above every other blessing, it says to them, here is your king. There is none but he who can clothe you in a spotless righteousness, who can cancel your hideous guilt and who can justify you at God's judgment seat, who can lift you into a new realm of pardon and purity. These three languages also represent the three ruling classes, the language of the people of God, the language of revelation, if you like, the language of philosophers, the language of wisdom, and the language of power. J.C. Ryle says that Jesus indeed, um, in him was hid all the treasures of revelation, wisdom and power, representing those three languages. And he goes on and says to the Christian minister, there are still no uh, three better languages to learn if you're going to understand Christ than which ones? Hebrew, Greek and Latin. So the truth still remains this day. It's been attested clearly to all, and Christ wasn't crucified. None of this happened in the, in, in the back blocks of Jerusalem where nobody knew, where there were only a few witnesses and where the truth could be twisted. twisted. This was done publicly with real figures, in real history, with real events that can be felt to this very day through the salvation of souls, through the present and applied working of the blood of Christ. Verse 21. Therefore, the chief priests of the Jews, after seeing this sign, said to Pilate, You shouldn't, don't write the king of the Jews. We don't want this guy to be known as our king. They're rejecting him to the end. And remember, the Jews here, according to John, are the enemies of Christ. So when John writes about the Jews, he's writing about the enemies of all true godliness. Do not write the king of the Jews. But he said, I am the king of the Jews. They want to replace the title. We'll keep the title. It's on there now. <coughs> can't take that off. They don't have white out on these things. It's etched in, so you can't pull that off. But what they want to write is a prefix. That is, he said he was. They want to weaken the phrase. They want to weaken the title. Um, the Jews don't want Christ to be proclaimed their king, but such he is. Uh, the Father's sovereign declaration of His Son as King cannot be stopped. It cannot be altered. When God holds the hand of the pen, it cannot be changed. And this is seen in Pilate's answer through an unregenerate man. What I have written, I have written. What is done, is done. You won't alter it because God's held my hand as I've dictated it and it's been written. And I'll proclaim his, Him as King. Uh, and I may hate the chief priests, I may hate the Sanhedrin, but out of spite and out of wrath, I will proclaim him as king. Uh, this is Jesus, the sign is saying, the Messiah. This was proclaimed uh, before his birth by the angels. This was proclaimed at his birth by the wise men. This was proclaimed only a week before as he entered into Jerusalem that he was king. In John 12, 13, blessed is the king of Israel who comes in the name of the Lord. And now it's being proclaimed one last time on the hill of Calvary that Christ is king of his people. Pilate does this out of wrath. I want you to turn to 76, Psalm 76 verse 10 to a very interesting scripture as we close out. You want to see God as sovereign? God can control all things, all events, all people. Well, if he doesn't do that, he's not God. If he's not in control of everything, he's not God. Well, have a look at Psalm 76 verse 10, where we've got this one little principial phrase here that shows us that even through the wrath of man, even through man's own anger against God, God will what? God will get the praise. Let me read it to you. Surely, that's a guarantee in Scripture, surely the wrath of man shall praise you. This seems like an oxymoron. When people are angry at God, when they're mad at God, when they don't want God's will to be done, God enables them to bring Him praise through doing His, the, the very thing they don't want to do, which is bring praise to Him through uh, even their own anger. God can turn all things for his glory. Right, everyone? Let's turn to now Romans chapter 9 and look at how Paul reviews an Old Testament story in how God took a man that hated the Jews, that hated God's people, 
and he rose, raised him up to bring glory to the very people that he hated or the very God of those people that he hated. He says in Romans 9, the Apostle Paul, verse 17, quoting directly from Scripture, because Scripture interprets Scripture, it's its best interpreter, says to Pharaoh, I, that is God, raised you, Pharaoh, the ungodly, evil king that I put in power. I raised you up for this very purpose. I made you Pharaoh for this purpose. I knew when you were in your mother's womb to be born and made sure you got there that I might what? For this purpose. Now the purpose is explained. That I might display my power in you. Any power Pharaoh had was from who? God. Scripture is very clear here. And that my name, God's power is only used to bring him glory. Not a pastor glory, not man glory, not a system glory, not a method glory, but him glory. That I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Everything Pharaoh did against the Jews brought greater miracles, brought greater testimony and brought greater glory to God. You don't think God's sovereign when he can bring praise out of the wrath of man? We've seen unregenerate souls be testimony to the greatness and the purity and the innocence of Christ in finding no fault in this just man. But just when you think it's all over and Christ is about to lay up his life on the cross and to breathe his last, the saving name of Jesus that is written takes effect. What Pilate has written, he has written. I want you to know that God not only sovereignly uses the person of Christ, he uses what is written about Christ for his glory as well. He uses the scripture, he uses tracts, he uses uh, printed materials and books. Anything that's written on Christ, God the Father uses. And in this case here, we have two criminals, as we know, either side of Christ, acknowledging that there is a placard. You don't think it got their attention that there's no criminal um, commitment on that cross? It's just a name. Now they're forced to look at the name of him who is between them. Most likely they know each other because they're insurrectionists and are being uh, condemned for the same crime. They're wanting to overthrow Rome, the same crime that Jesus himself at one point was uh, attested to have theoretically committed. And you can find that in Matthew 27, verse 44. But do we not see the wrath of man turn to praise on the very cross of Calvary? Let's have a look at it together. Uh, in Well, you can see it in Matthew, but maybe for time's sake, I'm just going to go to my text here and read it. We see this principle uh, in the salvation of the thief on the cross. You can turn there, Matthew 27, 44. The thieves also which were crucified with him cast the same in his teeth. What was the same? Verse 43. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. If he will have him, for he said, I am the Son of God. Where is your God? Where is your God who's going to deliver you now? Both, Matthew tells us, that these thieves are angrily, blasphemously, irreverently speaking to Christ in a very defamatory way, heaping insults on our Lord. And then Luke records that one of them even says that if you uh, are the Christ, they know what Jesus means, why don't you save yourself and save us? You don't think that's the wrath of man? Sounds like the wrath of man to me. You're the Christ, that's the name. That's your big claim to fame, Jesus. Why don't you, your, you and your saving name, save yourself and save us? Where's your God now? Why don't you come down off that tree and show us that you're truly God? And then, of course, we see the sovereign work of God's saving grace at heart, in the heart of one of the thieves. How could God turn around a wicked, depraved heart of a proven guilty insurrectionist on the cross of Calvary. 
earlier the thief that had been cursing him now turned to his companion and rebuked him for the evil things he was now saying. Saying, don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence, we are being punished justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. I'd call that a change of heart. And then the words, listen to this, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What's he acknowledging? You're my king and you have a kingdom. You are the king of all who truly believe you. And you don't think what Pilate wrote was used by God to change the praise of the wrath of man and the praise of Christ. That thief's wrath was changed into praise. Praise of the greatest one who has ever walked the earth. Praise to him who can only save us from our sins. In the sovereignty of God, history does not record a crucified saviour with a list of crimes over his head. It records a crucified Saviour with the truth over his head. He is the eternal King of glory. The sign even acted as a sign that was read and acknowledged that the thief alongside our Lord, when he said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Well, we'll close out our service, but let us take care that we ourselves knowledge, acknowledge like the thief did that Christ is our King and that His Kingdom should be set up within our hearts. Quite easy to say that uh, I'm okay, uh, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God but do we believe that Christ is only able to save us? That we can't save ourselves? Are we acknowledging that, that he is a just man that has done nothing wrong? Do we acknowledge his sinlessness? Do we acknowledge the thief also acknowledge his wickedness? We deserve to be here. This is the gospel at play. I'm a sinner. I deserve to be here. I should have been on that cross theoretically. And that thief, friends, represents you and I. We've stolen glory from God. We've chosen our own way rather than his. You don't think you've stolen from God? We've stolen, we've, we've done our own thing. We've given ourselves more than we've given God credit for. And we represent that thief on that cross. But we all also represent the grace of Christ to us upon that cross. Yeah. That he would reach out to us even when we are guilty and condemn and save us. What did Jesus say? Today you will be with me in paradise. Which thief are we like? The one who proclaimed him as king? Or the one who continues to deny him? even to this day. Friends, the great encouragement here is it's never too late for Christ to save someone. He can turn the wrath of a relative into the praise of a saint. The thief was moments away from his last breath and you don't think Christ is gracious? You don't think Christ is able to save everyone? From the person that's just said, you think Your father is going to save you. You can't even save yourself. And Christ saves him. (laughs) It is not too late, friends, for your unsaved loved ones, for your family, for your sons and daughters, uncles and aunts. Christ can save anyone. And a day will soon come when the despised Nazarene who hung on the cross shall put down every enemy under his feet. The kingdoms of this world, as Daniel foretold, shall be swept aside and become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. And at the last, every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is truly Christ the Lord. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer.